Human Health Hour. Black GPs and senior consultants giving black health advice. Improving black health equality. Can't Health Hour. Good morning, everybody. Um, nice to see you again on Saturday morning at our Welcome to our Caribbean African Health Network Health Hour. My name is Ngozi Ediasage. I'm a paediatrician and I work in Manchester. I'm also the medical lead for the Caribbean African Health Network and I'm delighted to welcome you all this Saturday morning. We have a really special guest. His uh, name is Dr. Kwasi Apia and he's a GP with a special interest in dermatology. Why is it important to talk about dermatology? Well, I think we get a really bad deal as black people. Very often you go to your GP with um, a diagnosis or a skin condition, and they're not really good at spotting um, what is specific to black skin. You know, I've had that problem myself. A year ago, I developed a rash on my face. And as a, as a woman, uh, black women, we take a, a special interest in our appearance. I went off to the GP and I was told it was a fungal infection. And for six months, I was either putting on a fungal cream. I got to the point where I was taking antifungal medication. And in the end, I decided to go and see someone privately and I got a biopsy done and it was eczema. So, you know, this is a, a genuine, something that happened to me, to tell you that it's really difficult sometimes to diagnose common problems in black skin. So Dr. Kwasi, and I wish I'd, I'd listened to a talk like this before I had my six months of medication with antifungals and, and, the, and the whatnot. I wish I'd had Kwasi on the call, but today he's going to enlighten us on challenges in black skin conditions, um, common things and perhaps what they look like, and what to do if you're in my position. So thank you very much, Kwasi, and I'm delighted to welcome you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ngozi. So I'm going to try and share my screen now and uh, share. Okay, can you all hear, see that? I can see it and I can hear it. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so, so my name is uh, Kwasi Apia. I am a, I'm a GP with special interest, as Dr. Ngozi said. Um, and uh, I work in Eastern of Hearts, uh, even, even North Hertfordshire as a GP, and then I do dermatology in uh, West Essex and Mid Essex, um, a part of my job. So um, I do um, more or less three days as a GP and two days in full um, dermatology clinic. Um, so recognizing black skin conditions. And so the aim on to, today, as uh, Ngozi said, it's more or less of, some of the challenges that we face um, uh, in, as make mostly UK medical practitioners in, in managing skin conditions in black skin. Um, the the um, other thing I also try and probably hit on a little bit on um, some of the skin conditions in pregnant women and how it looks like um, in black skin and in some of its management. Um, I have a special emphasis on this because I, I had a special specific invitation from one of your colleagues um, uh, that was trying to, uh, was a midwife and trying to get some of the um, um, uh, women and those to come to this talk. So I'll probably spend a little bit more time on that as well, in particular in pregnant women and some of the skin conditions. And then if we have time, I'll try and manage, go through a few skin conditions and in adults and children, black skin and how to manage them. And some of our normal cultural practices which can lead to some dermatological conditions um, and some of the misdiagnoses that we face um, from practitioners. Now, the skin is the largest organ in the body. Um, and unfortunately, um, in medical school training, so those of you who have been um, doctors who have been trained in this country, um, I, I attended Barts in the London Medical School um, in 2000. And I, I remember I only spent two weeks training in dermatology and let alone any training in skin condition on afro-caribbean skin um, so the skin type uh, is quite challenging for western trained doctors they are unfamiliar to skin type when we say skin type four five to six 
is a phototype of black skin, of Asian skin, Afro-Caribbean mixed skin and, and black skin. And, and, and this pre present pecu peculiar patterns and skin reactivity due to the skin condition. Um, and so that is quite a uh, challenging. And the demographics are, are in, you know, shows that 8.9% 8, 8 is non-white skin since 2001. And by now in 2011, it was about 14%. I'm sure in the current um, um, census that we did last year, possibly that I'm sure we'll be hitting the 20% um, um, increase by now. I'm sure of that. And, and uh, unfortunately for um, clinicians, doctors and nurses, and even midwives, um, dermatological textbooks use mainly Caucasian skin as most of most of the illustrations of signs and symptoms. And this book on the right, Mind the Gap, was uh, was co-authored by a, a medical student from um, I think his parents are Zimbabwean origin, and they have he he realized as a medical student, a black medical student, the challenges and the gap that he found in his studies, uh, we in particularly getting to understand some of the skin condition in black skin. So, um, he, you know, it's a really good book um, and it's good use in medical training. And it, they, the good thing is that rec med med medical schools have recognized this gap and this disparity in training and we are, are responding and doing something about it. Next month, I'm helping out medical school in East Anglia, Chelmsford, um, Anglia Ruskin University and doing a similar talk like this for them as well. Um, and there is also a, a Cambridge um, GP society who asked me to come and do something similar to, to it. So they, they, the gap has been recognized and uh, the good news is um, training um, institutions are making changes to help um, the population. Um, this was a, 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 an article written by one of the leading dermatologists uh, um, in Afro-Caribbean sectors in, in the country, uh, Dr. Fidia Dazi, um, in, back in 2013. And he did a questionnaire about trainees and consultants and the, uh, the, uh, the kind of exposure to ethnic skin. And 22% of them had only had formal teaching on skin of color or black skin. And uh, um, 4 percent had ethnic dermatology skin clinics as part of their training. Uh, and so and 71 percent of these consultants felt that dermatology should be ethnic dermatology or skin of black color or black skin should be incorporated in training. So there, there is a good response that this is happening. Why is this important? Look at the, the demographics in the UK is estimated by by 2051, 21 percent. And um, there will be uh, uh, of the population will be non-white, twenty-one percent of the population, and and uh, which which means that there will be a white population falling to about seventy-nine percent. And when we say non-white skin, we're talking about brown, Asian, and mixed skin as well. And sixty-one percent between um, sixty-one percent increase in non-white population since two thousand and one to two thousand and and to eleven. And there is such a a 243% increase in mixed race population, and it's predicted that this will rise more um, um, by, um, you know, by by 95 to 153%. So this is this is quite uh, um, staggering, and it's really important. So why is this challenging uh, that um, clinicians face? Because a black skin is much more contact; it allows less transmission of UV light um, and UV radiation could be either UVA, UVB, or, or, or a visible light. Um, and so the UV protection, it, but as a result of that, it's still UV protection is still not absolute for black skin. And I'll, I'll really emphasize this because one of the uh, commonest misconception is sun protection. For black people, they say because we're black, we don't use black. We don't use we don't need sun protection, and that's really a big misconception because a lot of skin conditions, particularly hyperpigmentation, is made worse um, if by sun exposure. Therefore, sun protection has very very good um, values, and we we'll talk about conditions like melasma. Um, um, sun protection is really important, so. There is no absolute protection. Yes, there are low incidences of skin cancers in black skin, um, um, but it, it's still it's still important in other skin conditions. Um, I've just um, 
come off come off a, a conference which I'm attending uh, today to just do this talk and I just listened to just about an hour ago to an Australian dermatologist in skin cancer um, um, practices in Australia and I actually asked him a question that do they have any data um, for the indigenous um, um, Australian population which is the aborigines which skin type four five six uh, and I was surprised about the response he said um, in their indigenous population, particularly, yes, there are various type of indigenous population because there is there are also white indigenous Australians, but the mostly aborigines, the black black skin ones, they will, if you tell them about um, sun protection factor, their response he gave to me is they will think about feeding your family rather than buying sun protection factor. <laughs> and, and that was a response that, that the lecturer said about an hour or so ago. Um, so it, we, we shouldn't uh, um, dismiss sun protection um, because there is, you can still get skin cancer um, in, in black skin, even though it is rare. There is other factors about the black skin. There is high loss of water. Therefore, the skin tends to dry quickly, um, but there is no difference between this um, pigment protection cells, which is uh, melanocyte per unit area among all races. However, the genes or the genetics in the ability to produce um, um, this melanin is what varies in, in black and brown skin. But the actual cell unit is the same across all skin, but the, uh, the production of the mel melanin is what changes, changes that pigment. Um, black skin, um, epidermis, which is the top layer of the skin, um, have more um, also have more of black uh, um, um, sun pro pigment protection cells, and therefore, um, um, whereas the the in 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 white skin, the pigment protection cells will be on the lower side. The other thing about um, something to more to do with maybe the climate, Africans tend to be much more active, have more active sweat glands um, than African Ameri Americans and, 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 and this is a study in America and something might be more related to climate. The other issues in dermatology is about hair. Dermatology is not just skin, dermatology deals with hair and skin and nails as well. So hair and black skin or black people are much more helical and much more spiral at the shaft. And therefore, there is a high increase of ingrowing hair um, in, in black skin. And but there is, you know, but then when you come to the deeper layer of the skin, which is the fats, there is not much difference layer uh, in the layer. Uh, but the other issue is also um, there are certain um, qualities of the skin in terms of collagen for, uh, production, uh, which makes that in sun exposed skin in Caucasian subjects shows reduced extensibility indicating that they haven't got much elastic tissues. Um, so therefore they get a lot of photo damage. So the protective thing of black skin is there is less photo aging. Um, so you can see a black woman who might be in her seventies and still have a good skin, a skin um, um, uh, protected from photo aging. Um, so, um, so the challenges with the UK practice and GPs who have not been exposed to this is they have a difficulty in appreciate redness, appreciate inf inflammation. So the textbooks will, will describe something we call erythema. So the doctor will be thinking about redness and it, it, they have very difficulty in appreciating that on black skin. And the other thing is when there is uh, um, hyperpigmentation. So certain conditions can lead to excessive pigmentation or darkening of the skin as a result of um, inflammation. And this is much more a particular problem from, for black skin. The other, the converse is also true that there is also um, hypopigmentation or lightening of the skin, which can be uh, in, in some important clinical clues for skins um, of, of black people. And the pattern of, of appearance of some of the skin um, and rashes on, on the black skin can change. So some eczema in black skin will have what we call a follicular pattern, uh, rather than you know what you, you know in, in the textbook they say scales and redness, which is which is what you see in Caucasian skin. But when you see an eczema in a, a black skin, it might be much more follicular, the round sandpaper roughness in the presentation. Um, Effects of um, itching, rubbing, scratching, um, 
has much more uh, effect on the black skin than the no, the, uh, than uh, uh, blacks and white skin. These are some few pictures of some normal variants that you see in black skin, and sometimes it might lead to some misdiagnosis by your GPs because they've probably not seen a lot of this before. So this is a condition that uh, we call idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis. Um, and this is a, a, a common variant. This, um, and sometimes your GP will prescribe this as a fungal infection um, because you are thinking of some um, skin condition now, which we, we call um, pityriasis vesicola. And that's the fungal infection, but that is not, this is not pityriasis vesicola. This is idiopathic guttate hepomelanosis, which is normal in some pigmented skin. Sun protection is really important using um, factor, you know, you, as a black person, you don't necessarily need a factor 50 plus, even factor 30, uh, 15 is, if, if it's, is adequate. Um, so this helps to make, um, make these um, condition less prominent. So you get all these white patches on your legs or your arms or even on your chest wall and they are not necessarily um, the same as pityriasis vesicola however if, if they you know if it feels rough if it feels itchy if it feels um um, um scaly uh, or when you touch it then you probably be thinking of uh, a different skin conditions which is might be fungal which you call pityriasis vesicola so so yes but it's something to recognize the other thing is uh, that the awareness of skin cancer is really, really important, um, um, particularly um, skin cancer uh, being rare in black skin. Skin cancer of nail or the palms or the feet can happen in black skin. However, there is a normal variant of what we call melonychia or ethnic melonychia, which you get a longitudinal pig pigment of the nails and which can be which is can be common in, in, in black people. So you will have usually have multiple of them um, um, or multiple nails, not one single nail. Um, and so, you know, if your GP has not seen this before, they might say, oh, I need a second opinion. I'm worried about melanoma uh, because of this. And, and there are certain things that uh, really will, you know, will, will show a dermatologist and reassure dermatologist that this is not a melanoma, uh, but this is more of a pigmentary melanichia. So somebody is on, can they be mutes, please? Thank you. Um, so that's that's uh, one thing. The other thing is, this is a very common condition. Um, you see Morgan Freeman's face is DPN uh, or Dermatosis Papillosi Nigra, which is a very, very common um benign uh, brown uh, lesions on, 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 the, on the face of, of black skin, um, particularly. And uh, this is... Uh, um, it is a variant of what we call seboric keratosis, which is another normal skin condition, which is common, very common in Caucasians. The older you get, you get that. Um, and this variant in black skin are much, much smaller, uh, much more on the neck um, and, uh, and the face. Um, and people who get is in areas where there is friction on the neck creases as well. Um, but they are absolutely fine. They are benign. Uh, they are much more of a cosmetic nuisance. Um, you might have a challenge to get in treatment cosmetically on the NHS, um, but once the diagnosis is made clear, if you can afford it, private treatment, cosmetic surgeons or cosmetics um, uh, providers will be able to treat this with, with freeze and burning them off for you with electrocautery, just risk of developing multiple scars if you burn them off. So um, it's something to, to, to not get notes about. Most people have seen there on their faces, they are not dangerous and they are not skin cancers. And also they are not moles, okay? So moles, we, you know, that even doctors, GPs who are not specialized in dermatology will see every skin lesion, they call it moles and they are not moles. And moles is something arises from a melanocyte or melanocytic lesions, but not every skin lesion is a mole. Um, you see doctors use that a lot. So I'm going to spend a few uh, few minutes talking a little more about black skin and pregnancy. And uh, I think there are some changes which are more related physiologically to pregnancy itself as a result of the hormones, um, which can show some pigmented changes. So 
conditions like melasma. Um, I'll show you a picture of that soon. And um, linea nigra, which is the pigmentation on, on the line on a, a pre pregnancy harm. And you also some hormone induced changes um, like uh, hyperpigmentation. So the nipple gets darker, the genitalia and the armpits get darker. These are all related to the pregnancy hormone. So the HCG, the precursor of the pregnancy hormone is also the same precursor for, for, um, uh, for stimulation of your melanocytes in producing melanin. So that's why everything gets darker when you are pregnant because of the hormones. So, um, so moles gets bigger, moles gets darker and the number of moles um, might increase in pregnancy. And then there are other dermatological conditions like stretch marks. Um, you also have nail splitting or dystonicolysis, excessive sweating it can be related um, in pregnancy. Um, and also you can have hirsutism, which is um, when you have um, hair growth in a male pattern, so around the sideburns or the mustache or beard area um, in a pregnant woman. And, and that is a very important thing to look out for because it, it might be due to something called virilization or, or of the fetus. And therefore, if you notice that, uh, um, you, you need to highlight that to your midwife or, or your consultant as a pregnant woman to have a look at it um, um, and make sure there is nothing wrong with the fetus. So yeah, it can be a normal variant, but it can, it can be lead to something else sinister. And then, um, Unfortunately, some people might have more excessive um, hair growth, um, which is hypertrichosis in various other parts of the body, which not, not necessarily in the, in the distribution of the male pattern, but they also hair shedding or what we call telogen effluvium can be also related to, to pregnancy. So this is melasma. Melasma is dark pigmentation um, of mostly it can be the cheeks, the forehead, the upper lips, um, um, and usually it can be pregnancy due to pregnancy. It, it, you know, it can happen in about 70% of pregnancy um, and usually much more to um, skin, skin of color or black skin, um, you get melasma. Now there are, you know, be careful of some treatments for it. Um, you know, you obviously when you, when you deliver the baby, it, it will take time to clear because at the precursor of the pigmentation is due to the hormone. Um, so if you, you know, if you will not bother too much when you're pregnant, you can seek treatment whilst you, whilst after you've had the baby, because, um, you know, some of the conditions, some of the treatments can have detrimental effects on the, on the, on the, on the fetus. So, these are stuff like these pigmentoma probably not used that this is on license in in the uk this is a, a cream um which um usually is used to treat melasma uh, but it's really um what we call the uh, uh is red listed in most g most uh, ccgs across the country i'm sure it is red listed in manchester um is a is a cream produced in germany um but you know there are people that can be sourcing this um, from the black market. Um, now, I have seen the constituents of what's in pigmentum, which is hydroquinone, um, a steroid, and a retinoid in products sold over the counter. I've been to an Afro-Caribbean shop um, in my local area in Harlow in Essex, and I've picked up a cream called Epidem. Um, and it's not a uh, um, so epidem, not epidem, which is the cream, the moisturizer, uh, and this is used as a skin bleaching cream. And so it's it's, it's use it's effective treatment in melasma, but you really don't use it when you're pregnant um, because of the hydroquinone in it. So and it's you know it has other problems which I'll talk to you about when we come to the cultural practices in um, skin pigmentation. Um, this other one, serums from La Roche Posay, you can buy them over in boots. Um, and these Eucerin anti anti pigments creams uh, and, and lotions, they are quite expensive, about 27 pounds. All these are not on the NHS. So please don't go to your GP to ask them to prescribe for you. You have to go to boots um, to get them. And I'll, I'll probably say if, you know, it's safe if you've not had, if you're, you know, after you've had your baby, but when you're pregnant, if it's not bothering you, please don't use these things. If you're not sure, um, you have to read the labels from the manufacturers. If it's if it's um, if it's saving pregnancy, and I'm, I'm you know just avoid it to be honest. Um, but the 
these these cream these lotions are used to help uh, melasma and hyperpigmentation in in general and you know after you deliver your baby as a pregnant woman you can you can get some of these stuff and get the treatment probably not get pigmentum from your gp or dermatologist but you can try pigment clear and uh, eucerin and thiamidol um, from from boots um other physiological physiological changes in the skin um, stretch marks, really, really difficult. I know people will try things like bio oil and things like that um, to, to get rid of it after the baby. And basically, you know, it's a, it's a matter of time. It's a, it's a skin elasticity from the hump from the from pregnancy um, and you get all these stretch marks on the, on the tummy and you've got the linea nigra in this woman. Again, you see the linea nigra and this woman, which is the dark end of the central line of the, across the abdominal wall from top to bottom. Um, and this is all physiological changes just because this pregnancy hormone makes pigmentation um, darker. Um, other things I talked about is uh, or distal nail changes or uh, onycholysis, which is where the um, tip of the nails become as if it's opening up. Um, you need to make sure there are no other skin conditions because this can also be related to um, conditions like psoriasis as well. So, um, so if there's nowhere else and it's just purely from the pregnancy, it might just be physiological. And then uh, I mentioned about the pigmentations of the nails or a melanikia, which is, which is a normal variant. And um, you know, it's, it can happen with pregnancy as well. I talked about um, hair loss um, or hair shedding. Um, telogen effluvium, um, people get that with pregnancy. You notice when you comb your hair, the comb is, is full of hair in it. Sometimes you, you're just having a shower and you can see your hair is breaking and, and, and it can be a, a sign of you know, a normal variant happening in pregnancy. It can also be a, 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 a sign for other things like iron deficiency, um, thyroid problems can also be giving you a theologian effluvium um, deficiency in certain things like zinc, um, vitamin D deficiency as well can also be leading to theologian effluvium. So um, just, you know, if, if it's persisting, get your doctor to do some blood tests to check what's going on. Uh, maybe nothing else. If it's during pregnancy, uh, mostly um, when you when you um, deliver the baby, they will come back to normal. It takes a while. It's just uh, just takes a few um, you know a few months um, to for it to recover um, um, when when you're pregnant. Now, now this is the hair citizen. This is where you have abnormal hair in male pattern around the beard and the mustache area. And um, and again, if it's related to pregnancy, um, make sure that there is there's no other problems with the fetus. Um, it can be related to um, uh, some what we call virilization of the fetus, um, where there is a masculinization of some part of the fetus um, and a female fetus. So, so just, just that, bear that in mind um, and then get um, your consultant or midwife to make sure everything is fine for pregnancy. There are some specific conditions which are purely related to pregnancy and this is um, when you have a lot of itching in your on your on your on your stump or your on your on, on your pregnant uh, pregnancy funders make sure that you haven't got jaundice on the eyes look in the eyes um, because it might be an indication of serious intrahepatic cholestasis um, where you know it needs some further investigation so you need to get inform your midwife to check your liver function test and make sure that there is no um, 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 jaundice in, on your liver, particularly when your eyes begin to look yellow and you're getting a lot of itching um, on your, in, during pregnancy. The, there is another condition which we, we call it polymorphic eruption in pregnancy or um, ad, its other name is pruritic urticarial papules and plaques of pregnancy or PAP for short. For short, and this is a really intense, itchy, um, raised areas on the skin, on the bump, and also on the arms. Um, and it's very, very itchy, and it feels rough. Uh, it feels like um, hives or urticaria, which we call them. That's urticaria, the same as hives. Um, and sometimes it be it will be it's so itchy, and really, it, Mama. It, it does happen. Mama, um, can the person please mute? Um, so it does happen in, in possibly mostly in, in people who are overweight, um, people who have multiple pregnancies 
and uh, and and scan time can scan time happen. It can last up to four to six weeks during the pregnancy. It's you know it can be it's it's quite common. I mean, you can get it in one in hundred and sixty uh, pregnancies uh, so on. So. Uh, really um, speak to your 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 midwife about it. It is things. It, it's postulated that it's related to the stretching of the skin um, by the, by the fetus. So that's why multiple pregnancy tend to get it more, um, and uh, and that leads to this intense itchiness on the skin, which is known as pop, as well. So that's 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 really specific related to to pregnancy, um, and then. Pemphigoid gest gestation is this is a, an immune system and condition. Now the, the issue with pregnancy is sometimes when, when you're pregnant, there, there's a switch of your immune system from what we call the cell mediated immunity to a humoral mediated immunity. And so the, and this is important physiologically for your body to not recognize the fetus as foreign. Um, so that is not to reject the fetus. So that switch is important. However, when that switch happens, it makes um, the, the woman susceptible to certain um, inflammatory skin conditions. So pemphigoid is an inflammatory skin conditions. And so you can get a specific types in pregnancy where you get these lesions on the on the on the on the on the on the, on the, on the stump as well as blisters um and which are quite itchy as well um and 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 it's quite rare i mean you can you can get it around the second to third trimester of pregnancy um and it's you know it says the figure says about one in fifty thousand or so it's quite rare but when you recognize that you have this inch itchy um blisters um, then you need to really need to speak to your midwife and a specialist to investigate. It's different from PAP. Um, PAP does not give you blisters, um, whereas um, pemphigoid gestation is, gives you blisters. So you need to um, recognize that if you're pregnant, you notice these changes, um, make sure you, you speak to your midwife and the consultant to investigate that. So you know, all these conditions um, the treatments, you know, you can do is creams, um, topical creams like moisturizers are quite useful. Um, E45, Aveeno, Cetriban, name it, it doesn't matter. There's no specific ones. Um, uh, topical steroids um, are quite safe in pregnancy for these skin conditions. In severe forms, um, some of the consultants will be happy to give you on a short course of um, oral um, um, tablets, steroids tablets, um, just to get this in condition down. Um, when you deliver the baby, there are much more wider variation of immunosuppressant uh, treatments after this, because after delivery, you know, most of these pregnancy related conditions, delivery is the answer. Um, uh, but after delivery, it might take a couple of months to clear. So there are much more options during um after that time which will not affect the baby and maybe there'll be some challenges with breastfeeding as well but um when you know when you get that that will be be, be able to discuss with your consultant so there are certain conditions skin conditions which worsen during pregnancy so acne in the early pregnancy can get worse um, eczema or atopic dermatitis will get worse psoriasis can get worse melasma as, as i said can get worse Sometimes you get, get these uh, eczema around the face, uh, which is called periorifacial dermatitis uh, around the, the lips um, area, can get worse during pregnancy. Uh, psoriasis is funny. It can be uh, because the psoriasis is also much more to do with a lot of immune system and because of the shift from the cell mediator to immune immune system, psoriasis can actually get better. Um, but it can get worse in some people. Um, and things like rosacea gets get worse. Skin tags like like other moles, uh, other moles as well gets a lot more during pregnancy. Um, and then um, and people with conditions like SLE or lupus um, gets gets worse during pregnancy. Hand eczema um, also or pomphylox where you get tiny tiny blisters in the hands also can get worse um, during pregnancy. Things that get improved um, in the late stage of pregnancy, acne gets uh, gets better. In the late stage, sometimes eczema get better. Um, this condition, which is uh, very high prevalent in um, 
Afro-Caribbean population is hydrogenitis suprativa. It is uh, people who get recurrent boils in the armpits, recurrent boils in the in uh, under the breast, in the groin area, around the anal area. Um, these recurrent boils is not just boils; it's sometimes it is what we call inflammations in the apocrine uh, sweat glands, which is the high population under the armpits under the breast, um, in the groin area, uh, and it's a condition called hydrogenitis suppurativa. It can leave a lot of scars. It can leave a lot of um, discharges and sinuses and has a big psychological impact on patient. Um, and uh, really, it's quite, it, it can be quite very debilitating psychologically as well as physically. So um, luckily, it gets better in, 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 in pregnancy. We don't know why, uh, as, as I've already mentioned about and, and psoriasis as well. So now I'm just going to look at some general skin conditions that's not necessarily related to pregnancy, but you might be seeing it um, on your children, on yourself, where uh, it looks a bit different on, uh, on, on white skin. So this is chicken pox, which is have a lot of blisters there, chicken pox and black skin. Um, um, and this is on a child with chicken pox on hold of back. The issue with this is not, not just recognizing the condition, but the effect after treatment. You see people who get scars or post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation after treating chicken pox. Um, and it can go years and years and dif difficult to get rid of. So some of those products that I showed you um, on the earlier slides of the pigment clear, and uh, and the uh, eucerin creams which are uh, more cosmetic products over the counter are quite good for post inflammatory scars from anything from chicken pox from acne and things like that um, so they help with the pigmentations because really um, you know on the national health is difficult to get support and treatment for this uh, because they are considered mostly cosmetic um, eczema in black skin uh, can leave much more of a, a leathery, what we call lichenified skin. This is a child with eczema and you can see this a snake leather-like skin surface on, 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 the, on, the, on the skin. And look at the back of this child's hand uh, and their repetitive itching makes this what we call lichenification worse um, from, from, from scratching. And, uh, really, it's it's you know it's about recognizing the eczema earlier and treating it earlier, and uh, um, you know, and that's just kind of the challenge. You know, the problem with with um, with clinicians is when they when they even know it's eczema, the approach and treatment is different. You know, they will give you a mild steroid cream because of this steroid phobia of treating eczema properly initially. Um, and like in black skin, because the skin is thicker and hardened and leathery, this is what we call a follicular appearance of eczema in, in a child. And this is like in the, in of eczema. Uh, because of the leathery appearance, if you use mild eczema, uh, mild steroid creams like hydrocortisone, it's really not going to touch it. You need a potent steroid cream like Elecon or something stronger, even Demovid for a few days, yeah, not long, long term, but a few days to hit it hard, then you can wean down to the weak steroids um, because obviously steroid use and black skin can also cause other things of depigmentation, but really you need to treat the skin and also you need to appreciate when it's infected because it's not red and inflamed, which is what the textbooks teach us to do for infected eczema. Inflammation is red. You're not going to see redness on, on a black skin because it's not inf that's not a sign of inflammation in black skin. So, you know, sometimes to recognize that is an infected eczema that needs maybe an antibiotic uh, as well as the cream for the steroids, um, it's, it can, you know, it can lead to um, late diagnosis uh, because it's presented on a black skin. This is another skin condition um, known as keratosis pilaris. It's a variant of follicular eczema. So if you can see uh, the previous eczema, this follicular eczema, um, this condition might have this, particularly on the arms or upper arms of children. Um, they might have eczema, they might have no eczema. It's called chicken skin. You can feel it, it feels rough, it feels follicular. These you know, needs regular moisturization. The, the kind of moisturizers which has 
um, um, uh, products like urea in it. Urea um, is a very, very good for very rough skin. Urea will be found in products that you can buy over the counter. So, you know, everything you need to go to the GPS if you don't pay for prescription is cheaper. And, but, you know, sometimes waiting for that, you can't get an appointment. If you can afford it, buy it. You know, you go to Boots, you can buy urea cream. Um, there's one of them which costs, contains 10% urea on eucerin. Um, the 25% called Flexitol. You can actually use it for crack feet and things. It's really good for keratosis pilaris. It's used regularly. I think CeraVe does some urea containing ones with a bit of salicylic acid, the CeraVe essay. So all these stuff, you can buy them easy on the skin because the more you moisturize this, the more you're able to flatten these um, follicles or pilaris or keratosis pilaris and it can be itchy yes occasionally we get itchy your gp can add a bit of throw in some steroid in a much more potent steroid like elecon not um hydrocortisone which is we cannot not do anything to it so just just recognizing it and sometimes you need to you know you need to explain to your your doctor play look I, you know this is this is what i've got um you know it might not be and if you give you weak steroids i well you know, look at my skin type is different. It might, might not respond uh, as, you know, with a weak steroid. It might need something stronger. This is a, a periorofacial dermatitis. It's a type of eczema around the face. Um, this is the ones I told you that can get can get worse when you get pregnant. Uh, but this is much more follicular, rough sandpaper appearance. And is a type of eczema. Um, you know, it can be due to, so eczema can be caused by so many things. It can be uh, either genetic, which we call a topic, it can be allergic, which will be very clear on the history. So um, don't, you know, it's not what you eat. Um, uh, you know, when when you have an aller allergic reaction to something, you know straight away. Um, it might be these kind of allergies will be products, mostly um, cosmetics or, you know, something that you've used, sometimes even hair dyes or, you know, shampoos or something that you, you use on your hair, you can still get a reaction on the face, not necessarily only directly on the hair. It, it, the allergic contact dermatitis does not necessarily be within the same area. It can be proximity. I've, I've seen people with allergic eczema uh, on their face from the, from going to do their nails. So the, the acrylics that's been used on the nails, the fumes of of the acrylics as they smell it, it, it actually causes a reaction on your face, not necessarily on the nail itself. And then you do a patch test in dermatology and it shows that they are allergic to that. So some of these things just need to be recognized um, and then managed appropriately, appropriately. I mean, the, sh the problem with the face is quite sensitive area. So things like steroids, you need to be careful about the type to use. So this is just the eczema that has been scratched a lot and it becomes lichenified and thickened and hard. Um, these are some of the creams that I've been mentioning. So things you can buy over the counter, Cetriban Dermo, is, uh, it's got antimicrobial properties in it, which is really good, a green one. It's very good for shaving beards, Diprobase ointment. So when you have very dry skin or black skin, um, ointments are much more effective than creams. The issue is people don't like ointments because they feel like Vaseline and sticky on clothes and they want to use cream. Fair enough. If you want to use a cream, it means that you need to use it more frequently. You need to take some um, in a pot, carry it at work, you know, after two or three hours when your skin is dry, moisturize it. So if you slap a, screen, a, a cream on in the morning, uh, by the time you make it rich midday is dried up. So you need to use it frequently. Whereas ointments, even though they are much greasier, they stay on better. Um, some people prefer gels like double base. Um, it's all your preferences. And these are the steroids that I've been telling you about uh, for use for, for eczema. So elecons are quite strong steroids um, and then comes down to um, hydrocortisone, which are weak steroids. Um, there are some steroids which has a combination of various things in it sometimes has a bit of antibiotic in it like fusidin h which is a weak steroid but it's got a bit of antibiotic in it um so when you have an eczema on the face which is uh, which is much more sensitive skin so if it gets infected they might give you something like that but short course of topic and um, very strong steroids probably not recommended from the face 
Um, Umavate might be okay for a short time for your face because it's mild, moderately potent, um, but you know, for only for five days or so, not more than that. Then you've got itchy scalp where you can get some steroids like uh, Betnovate um, scalp applicator because your watery is not for, it's eczema of the scalp, much more for the scalp, not the hair. So it's, it has to be watery to massage it directly deep into the hair. So this is what happens if you use a lot of st strong steroids for a long time on eczema. So you can get depigmentation on the area where you where you treat with steroids for on a black skin. Um, and so that's there is a, is a balance we really, really about treating it how long um, and when you notice that there is the skin is fading, um, really make sure you withdraw from the steroid. So it can it can be a problem as well. So they are all having they haven't got they are not without problems with steroids. Ringworm, ringworm in children in black skin uh, is quite common, particularly in the scalp. Now, if you have ringworm in in, in your child, an Afro Caribbean child um, like this, um, really to be honest, you need to you know be insistent that topical creams and uh, things like that don't really, really, really work well on the scalp. Um, you really need to um, be on some oral treatment, what we call tabinafin tablet. Um, yes, on the skin, on the face, you might be able to do it with some uh, canistin cream, but when you start getting into the scalp um, and deeply and it's spreading, um, it, it's, you know, you need to hit it from inside out. And when you're treating the child, you need to treat the siblings, um, one about sharing combs, towels, and things like that. Yes, other siblings, you can give them the shampoos like Nisro shampoo to, to if they have any signs of mild fungal infection. But if you get areas like this, the risk is it can develop this thing called carrion. Um, it can get pussy um, um, and it's just discharging. Um, and the worst thing is a GP would think this is a bacterial infection and give you antibiotics. Because it's not anti, it's not a bacterial infection. This is due to the, the inflammation from the fungus um, on the area, and therefore you need oral antifungals. I know Griseofovine, um and those ones are quite difficult to get in the UK. So tabinafine, difficult to get it in 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 liquid form. Um, um, but if you if you, you can crush the tablet, um, a four week course for a child. Um, have the dose of what is uh, the, uh, and, and adults. If the doctors check the dose, they will be able to give you one. Well, sometimes they need to check, you know, a blood test for your liver. But honestly, if you, you know, if you have a background or baseline liver test, which is normal, um, you might not need to do that before. But, you know, most doctors will be safe to do a blood test first to give you erotabinephine and that's fine. That's good practice. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it won't work with creams. Um, the, the, the key is they're resistant to creams in these tablets. Um, so this is pityriasis vesicola. If you remember the first picture I showed you of, of uh, um, idiopathic gutate hypomelanosis, which is this the, that rash which is common, um, sometimes is misdiagnosed as this, as pityriasis vesicola, which is a fungal infection, which um, um, sometimes require a uh, required topical um, um, antifungal showers or shampoos um, um, like Nisro, which can work as well. So um, if it persists, sometimes oral tablets can be can be given by the doctors. Acne. Um, so the issue with black skin and acne is mostly the acne has to be treated the same way, um, but is a risk of hyperpigmentation. And this is a post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation from black skin. So if people avoid squeezing them, um, blackheads, because the more you squeeze them, the more you, you cause scarring and inflammation. The other issue is in moderate um, X, um, acne, um, GPs should have a very, very low threshold of referring um, patients to have oral treatment or oral retinoids. Um, obviously, you have to cancel women about childbearing age, about um, contraception, because oral retinoids cannot be given unless you're on some contraception to cover you because it will kill a baby if you fall pre pregnant with that. And topical retinoids are also, uh, you know, they mentioned caution or actually contraindicated in pregnancy as well. So acne can be of various forms. It can be either from from inside endogenous ones. So it will be um, come related to like things like polycystic ovaries. Um, and then 
there are some things that can cause acne. So cosmetic products, particularly pomade, you know, when you, you plait your, your hair and you use, you grease it with the pomade. Um, and when you wash your hair, the, the hot, hot water causes the pomade to drift into the forehead and you can see acne form on the forehead. And that's a pomade acne um, that is particularly common in black skin. Also, steroid in skin lightening agents um, can also lead to acne. And, and also um, people who do setting, you know, setting jobs and setting medications, stress um, can cause acne. Um, UV lights can be protective. Some people mention that when you go on holiday, when you tra travel back home to Africa or somewhere, you, you notice that your acne get better. Um, diet is a bit controversial, but they say that low glycemic diets can be protective for acne. So I did mention about a post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Therefore, you should have a low threshold for referral for, for, um, uh, for oral retinoids or rarcutane um, in the hospital. So some skin, skin um, dermatology in the communities provide that. It's very rare in the UK, in, in, in the UK but mostly this is a secondary care West where you, you need oral retinoids. So um, have a low threshold, seeking your doctor's to, to refer you um, if you're getting scarring, particularly in your acne. Um, otherwise, um, it, it's, it will become difficult to manage. So I, I did mention about the protect, sun protection is really, really important. So sun protection um, with factor 30 plus, uh Hi, Kwasi, you seem to have been muted. We can't hear you anymore, sorry, thank you. Yep. That's fine. Yeah, sorry, I don't know why. No, that's fine. Yeah. Just to say okay. there are lots of questions in the chat. <laughs> okay. So um, it would be great um, if we, we have an opportunity to, to address some of them. We can, yeah, we can try and see what we can, we can address. Um, so things like uh, sun protection for this will be important. I did mention some of the creams that you can get, some of the things you can get over the, over the counter um, uh, that I've already mentioned earlier on. Um, most of them need to be prescribed by your doctor. Chemical peels, um, CO2 laser, intense pulse therapy. These are all cosmetic stuff and you get it really difficult to get um, approval on NHS for these things. Um, but yeah, if you can afford it, they are there, um, you can do that. I did mention this product over the counter for, for, for that. Now, finally, I'm gonna quickly rush to some of our cultural practices which affect our skin. Um, Skin lightening, I did mention, this is the Epidem cream that I saw in the, in, in the Afro shop. Um, and if you really read the ingredients, it contains um, hydroquinone, retinoid, and a steroid. Um, and it will beautifully lighten your skin, but it will cause post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. It can cause um, acne um, and all the side effects are related to, to steroids as well. So just be careful there, all the Carol products, if you read them, they've all got steroids in them. And, you know, so we just need to be careful about these things um, in, in our cultural practices. So these are pictures people who have bleached the skin and you can see their acne um, will be on the faces and it's very, very obvious um, there and it's really difficult to, to manage that. Um, the, the condition called exogenous ochronosis, which is a, a bluish purplish pigmentation, which comes from the use of these skin lightening agents. And, and this is very visible in this woman's cheek um, from repetitive use of products like Epidem for skin lightening. This is an Asian woman. You can see that more. It gives you this slate skin. An issue with this, this can be permanent and really it's difficult to get rid of this pigmentation if you continue to use that, that those products. I talked about pomade acne. Um, this is what happens when you use a lot of pomade for, you know, greasing the hair. Uh, it can leave a form of acne. It can still be managed like normal acne. And obviously avoiding this, um, um, those pomades can help, um, and but it can still be treated like normal acne. Um, hairstyle traction alopecia. Um, either from braiding or wigs or extensions. Um, you get a lot of uh, fringe sign on the hair on the frontal side, um, but you really can get all these loss of hair. The hair begins to break around, around the, the fringes. Um, and then you can get all the patches there. You can see this is all traction alopecia. 
Um, it's reversible um, if if the the breeding style is stopped, um, but sometimes it can be challenging to manage. Is sometimes uh, the doctors might need to prescribe you some much more potent steroid. The scalp has a a better resistance to stronger steroids uh, compared to the rest of the body. Um, so it's really like a, um, uh, it's really important to uh, you know to make sure that you know you get you get checked by a doctor um, if you know if this thing becomes a problem from your hairstyles. Um, Pseudofolliculitis is uh, razor bumps, very, very common in our men from, uh, from shaving or razor bumps. Um, and really using some of the product that I showed you, the creams with antiseptic wash in there um, during shaving can, can help. Um, if you are very susceptible to them, um, it's probably better to allow your hair to grow because otherwise the more shaving, the ingrowing hair causes it to grow back. Um, sometimes... Um, creams like um, fusidin H, which is a uh, uh, which is a bit of antibiotic with a steroid cream, um, can help to bring the inflammation down, and that can be useful if, if the doctors are struggling to manage this with with just antiseptic washing alone. Um, but yeah, that's quite common. Unfortunately, in severe form, it can lead to very scarring, and that scarring um, can cause a lot of problems, like what we call this is. Acne, um, um, uh, chiloidialis, which is kind of very, very difficult to treat. When it reaches here, you really, really leave into scarring. Um, it needs injections and very potent steroids. And sometimes um, you need specialist treatment with laser treatment and, and um, plastic surgeons to treat this. It's, it's quite challenging to treat that. There's no creams or, or, or tablets which will work with this. Uh, Retinoids, oral retinoids or racutane like you use in severe acne can be very helpful if it is recognized early and referred to the hospital to treatment. So these are some of the things that you can use to, to wash the face, to help the shaving practices um, so that you can decrease them de developing razor bumps. So all these can be bought over the counter. Demo has, they all got hexidine antimicrobial stuff in it, um, which can be quite, quite helpful in that sense. So um, in a women, there are some other very rare conditions, which um, what we call folliculitis decalvan. It needs a lot of scarring, um, similar to the acne one in, in men. This needs to be early um, referral um, because, you know, it's, it's, it needs some treatment like uh, um, hydrox hydroxyquinone um, and, and which has to be given in a hospital. So, um, if 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 your GP you know you know realize this, you need to be referred as soon as possible. This is another condition: central centrifugal secretated alopecia or CCCA. Uh, it seems to be much more only of African women. Um, um, very no one knows what causes it. Might be genetics. It might be due to traction. It might be hairstyle using of um, um, you know hot combs. Um, but really. It's really, really difficult to understand what causes this. Um, but, you know, you have to rule out fungal studies and things like that. But, you know, it leads to these patches of, uh, of hair losses or hair thinning in the middle, um, more or less, even more in the central form, similar to that. Um, and really, really it's tricky, very, very difficult to treat. Um, and really, you need to refer need to see your doctor to be referred early as, as soon as you notice these conditions. Keloids, um, again, very, very common. Um, it can be from any scars, piercing, trauma, um, um, all sorts of things can lead to keloids. Um, and, but it's, you know, it's really much more, as I told you, in black skin, our collagen fibers are much more active and therefore um, it, it can lead to over, over excitement of the healing that can lead to this um, keloid formation from traumas and scars. So um, if you if you have a high risk and it can be familiar if you have five family history of have any any scar which is developed into keloids, um, then you need to be careful on subsequent surgeries and piercings and things like that. Um, this is somebody who had um, who had uh, shingles um, and developed uh, keloid as a result of from the area of shingles. And it's really, really difficult. You can get things like silicone sheets over the counter, 
Um, sometimes we can prescribe steroid creams um, or sometimes you can inject steroid um, injection into the keloids. Um, and then, you know, when we struggling and you get to the plastic surgeons to think of laser treatment and all sorts of surgical stuff. But, you know, think of it that way, that it is, it's a surgical or incision or scar that led to the keloid. Hence, the surgeon's last thing is to subject you to another surgery because it can still lead to further keloids. So it's really difficult to treat. Okay, I think that's probably about it. And uh, I will try and see um, if I can answer some of the questions for the next 10, 15 minutes that I have. Thank you very much. Yes, there, there are lots and lots of questions and thanks for your talk. And thanks very much for um, the interesting photographs. So we've got 15 minutes. And I'm going to try and get through as many questions as possible. There are loads and loads of questions and some of them you've answered during your talk. So there's a question about what you can do for razor bumps in men. And you show some of the very florid pictures mm -hmm. and you mentioned about using fusidin. Is yeah. that available over the counter? No, you can't get fusidin over the counter. No, um, I, I think you, you need a prescription for that. Some pharmacists are happy to prescribe them with fusidin H, even fusibet, because a different fusidin H is fusidin has, uh, fusidin H has got hydrocortisone in it. Fusibet has got uh, betnovate. That the issue is betnovate is a potent steroid. And so we try advise not using it on the face. Um, on the scalp will be okay because the, the skin of the scalp is a little bit tougher. Um, so therefore it will be, it will probably be safe on the scalp, but not on the face. But really it's about the practices about trying to use antiseptic creams uh, or washes during shaving and um, that can decrease the uh, presentation. And if it gets inflamed, when you see pus forming, it means that there is some infection in there. You might need uh, um, some antibiotics. Sometimes it's fungal. Um, sometimes swabs need to be taken by your um, the GP to send you off um, just to actually see what is causing it and treat the underlying thing. But it's really about shaving practices. That's really brings it up. Okay. I hope um, the council might just say, if we can make this, um presentation available for those that want to have a look at it. Um, now, the other thing that someone's asked is the effect of diet on any of these skin conditions. So yes, diet, diet is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very, um, it's a very contentious area. There is, there are some things that it will definitely be true. Obviously high glycemic index, sugar, um, salt, um, um, you know, sweet stuff, all those, bad stuff for cardiovascular things tends to affect skin. So that's what a high glycemic index says, but you will, there are not a lot of randomized controlled trials in dermatology to show that, you know, explicitly, if you stop this, this will happen. Cause it's most of these things is multifactorial. It's not just the diet alone, it's genetics and things like that. So um, you will definitely and find it. Specifically that can link to diet. So if people have eczema and think, oh, I'm going to cut this out of my diet, you don't think it will help? It, it, well, so if you have noticed a pattern, um, and that is that is really important. It's, it's it doesn't hurt to to cut things from diet. And so people with eczema, for example, if you have um, it, eczema, is an atopic condition, um, which is high propensity to get asthma, eczema, hay fever, and all those things and allergies. So some people can try. Um, um, go against dairy free okay dairy free uh, but most of the things with dairy intolerance will be gi presentation first or, or guts representation first the skin might be a delayed type reaction so if you know that it's, the skin reaction is more delayed type so there there, there is a high chances that they might make a big, bit of a difference but eczema is it is a barrier problem it is a barrier problem of the skin rather than an allergy per se so okay. it, it's it's much more the same yeah that's fine um there's a question about moving to warm climates and help with eczema and dermatitis what's yeah. your opinion on the effect of the weather on these conditions it, it's absolutely true because that's why we use phototherapy in treating managing eczema um, so we do narrowband UV light in, in our department um, for, for treating eczema, psoriasis, and a lot of skin condition. And most 
most people will say when they go on holidays, their eczema gets better. So um, if you have the luxury of moving to a warmer climate for your eczema, good on you. <laughs> Maybe we should try and prescribe it on the NHS. Um, uh, bad eczema, a holiday in Jamaica. <laughs> um, someone has asked whether can nigricans acanthosis, can it disappear? What, what again, what? Uh, nigricans acanthosis. Now, yes, the acanthosis nigricans is, uh, is, is a dark velvety patches in the body. It can't disappear, it's, it, it's difficult. Um, the most important thing to make sure there's no underlining cause, um, uh, mostly checking for diabetes, thyroid function. Uh, um, and if, if those things has been excluded, um, it can't it can disappear. The other thing is, I told you about hyperpigmentation, sometimes weight, can, can be due to that. So excessive um, fat um, can, you know, can break down and uh, affect the melanin, melanosis in, in, in terms of pigmentation. So weight loss and all those things can help. Um, there, there are very, very little um, you know, success in those things. You can try on all the pigmented um, creams that I mentioned. Some of them do work on that, but it's, you know, really, it's difficult. One of the things that I think is really important for these health hours is for when at the end of the health hour that there are at least three important messages that I like people to take away. Mm. So one of the ones I really want to make sure that anybody who is listening and is knows somebody or is using skin lightening creams about the dangers of that. Now, you, you mentioned a, a cream that had three ingredients. Mm. Which is the key one that is, is dangerous? Because people use steroids for all kinds of things and that in itself cannot be dangerous. Is it the hydroquinone? It is the hydroquinone. So the, so the message for everybody listening, if you have any creams that have hydroquinone, yeah. put them in the bin. Yeah. Is that strong enough? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a hydroquinone that causes the, uh, um, the exogenous alkalinosis, which leads you to that slate pigmentation, that purplish pigmentation, which is, is permanent and you cannot get rid of. Um, there has been, even in America, there's been... Yeah, just before you go on, sorry, you, you described something, but for somebody who has a friend mm. who's listening to this, what you describe that you can see on the skin is not what they're going to tell their friend. They will, they will just say a black coloration. So I suppose that terminology is fine for other medics, mm -hmm. but what I really want to get home is for anybody who notices those kind of patches on yeah. a friend's face and suspects that they are using these creams. Mm -hmm. Apart from the black patch, because you're, I think people use it to try and get lighter, but if you're gonna leave a black patch, that is counterproductive. Yeah. What else is there? Is there anything else that is dangerous to use? There, it's also there's that's the that's the next thing I was gonna say. There are there are there are studies in America that it can cause cancer. Um and uh so the FDA in America has actually banned it in in, in I think in some, some places in America. So so yes, there is a carcinogenic e um, effect in it as well. So well, number one, you want to be light, it's gonna make you darker. Number two, it can cause cancer. So please, 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 anything with hydroquinone. Are there any things that hydroquinone is useful for? Why, why is it manufactured? I, th I think that, uh, I mean, the, the, the melasma is it's really, the, really the key treatment for melasmas, but is specifically for that. And is even, even that is regulated, um, is re regulated for that. Um, in the UK, you cannot get hydroquinone on prescription. Uh, on an NHS, I don't know any CCG that approves it. Um, consultants do prescribe it for melasma um, and some severe hyperpigmentation, um, but really it's all private prescription. They source it out from Germany and stuff like that. So there, there is no condition really, if we can't get it on the NHS, there is no condition that you actually need hydroquinone for them. Yeah. Um, and this is a personal feeling about the melasma pregnancy. I always feel that it's, you know, you're pregnant. It's one of the effects of, it's like saying, well, I don't wanna be fat, but you know, but I still wanna have the baby. Yeah. It's one of those conditions that just come with being pregnant. Yeah. And that's the way I would approach it and ask people to approach it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we've got seven minutes. Now there's a question here that says, why are some medications freely available in other countries, but difficult to get in the UK? And I don't know whether they're 
specifically asking about the epiderm. Maybe they've tried to get medications and skin products here, but in some other countries it's available and it's not available here. Do, do you know of, I, I don't know what they're, they're, what they're specifically referring to. I don't know what's specific, yeah. I, I think it's, I think every medication has to be MHRIG approved and uh, um, and if it meets the standard, it's it's yes, but um, yeah, it, it, it has to be ethically approved and it depends on individual countries and what, what governs the other decision on that. Okay. Um, the other thing I was going to ask is that someone's asked about protopic. Yeah. I'm medic, but I'm, dermatology is not my area of uh, specialization, so I'm struggling with some of these. Could you recommend a protopic for eczema? So I gather this is either a medic or somebody who has been trying to treat their eczema and now knows everything about it, more than me. Protopic uh, is, a, is a carcinuric inhibitor, which is an, what we call an immune modulator. So it's not a steroid. So the advantage of protopic is it doesn't thin the skin like steroids and, and it can be used longer um, than steroids. So it's not very effective for severe eczema, but for moderate eczema and for maintenance of, of, um, of eczema, it is safe because it doesn't thin the skin. Um, it's also safe for sensitive areas where you can't use steroids. So like the face, the groin um, in the private areas or in genital areas and stuff like that, where the skin is much more sensitive, uh, protopic. Um, in fact, flexural psoriasis, uh, protopic is an unlicensed indicator. Eczema on the face, perioral facial eczema, eczema around the eyes um, um, and the face as well. It's, it's safe to use protopic um, uh, in, as a first line. So the it's protopic is one, or one of them. The other one is elidol. So it's um, um tacrolimus and pericolimus those are the two yeah it's the same okay. class of drugs so hydro the thing about lightning creams is one take-home message the second thing i think is important is sun creams yeah. now we hear lots of different um advice about sun creams and black people and yeah. i know lots of my friends will say well you know when i was in the west indies when i was in nigeria i didn't use sun cream why do i have to use sun cream here yeah. should black people use sun cream and if we'd have to well if we should yeah. What's the recommended um, factor level that you'd recommend for children and adults? So, so because the lucky, the, you know, our lucky of having their pigmentation means we have some protection. So you don't need a factor 50 sun cream. Factor 30 at least is, is, is okay because of the sun, the, di the direct lights, UVA, UVB, um, can cause hyperpigmentation. So a lot of the hyperpigmentation conditions, melasma, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, et cetera, from eczema, from other inflammatory conditions, gets worse with direct light. So sun protection, in that sense, is relevant to that. So if, you, if you're worried about the scars from your acne and other things as well, so sun protection is important. So you might not get skin cancer from sun from you know, from, from your, from, from using sun protection because you, you're very low risk. And in fact, the, the skin cancer that we get in, in, in uh, black and a Asians is mostly the acral skin cancer of the nails and the palms on the feet, which you really, you're not, it's not exposed to your sun. So that's not, those are not the protection that you want. The protection you want is mainly for hyperpigmentation and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation as well, because the burning and the damage and things like that cannot, can make it worse. So in that relation to that specific question about should we be using sun cream or not? So if somebody wants to go on holidays to Spain, they're black, should they pack factor 30 in their suitcase? Factor 30, I'll say though, yes. Okay. So second take home message, use skin, um, some sun cream, but you don't have to have factor 50. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the we've got a couple of minutes left. I will... Someone's put a question here, which I think is important to address. They've said, if we are not going to use creams with hydroquinone, what are we going to replace them with? I think the, the answer is, do, do we need to replace them? These are skin lightening creams. They only have one purpose, to make your skin lighter. Do, do we need to replace those creams? I suppose this is my personal reflection on this, and I suppose people have a different take on it. Yeah. And maybe... Dr. Kwasi can come back and we can talk about the whole thing about 
skin lightening and, and whether it's necessary or not. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that we need to replace it with anything. Absolutely, I agree with that you. That would be my response. Sorry. Um, I think the last question I'm going to address, we, we try in these sessions to give very broad advice. Um, the questions are really helpful because what I find is that when people put questions in the chat, that there are lots of other people that have exactly the same questions. And we also have viewers on YouTube and Facebook that aren't able to put questions. And so these questions are helpful. So we've got a question from someone who says, what is the cause of excessive hair growth on arms, legs, armpit, face in a young black woman who isn't pregnant? The GP has said it's normal and has ruled out polycystic ovarian syndrome and has checked that all hormones are in the right range are in the right range. So this will be your last question because we've got a minute to go. Yeah. Um, but go ahead. So, so, so if ex excessive hair growth, which is hypertrichosis, which is not hirsutism, so for us is not in male distribution areas around the mustache and stuff like that, then um, I think it, it, sometimes it can be idiopathic. This is one thing. Sometimes it can be genetic. Some people's genetically might be, might be something to do with their, you know, their past. Some, sometimes it might be the issue. Um, I think the distribution is very important. And if it's an area which is pattern of a male um, growth, and even uh, uh, and, and GP feels that there is all the blood tests are fine, it's important to maybe refer to an endocrinologist to make sure there is, you know, there is nothing weird and wonderful that is being missed. And that that is the only thing I'll say, because the, the pattern is really key. If it's as, if it's not just hair everywhere but if it's a, like beard and mustache area and is a pure true hirsutism then there has to be at least reassured from a, an endocrinologist investigation and make sure that there is nothing being missing because you can get all these um, hormone producing tumors and things like that which is very you know can can very misleading too very rare but very good rare. To love. thank you so much for this session i, I i've really enjoyed it We've had lots of questions to, to show that it's something that people re really want to know about. And I'm hoping that what we can do next time is invite you back for just a question and answer session because I don't think we did the, the questions justice today because we didn't have enough time, but thank you all the same. Thank you very um, much. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to the uh, Caribbean African Health Network team in, in a minute. But just before we do, I'd like to say that next week we have a session on COVID. Um, a year ago, I think it's this weekend to a year, we, we did a session on just the vaccine at that time. And by that time, I thought by, by now we wouldn't be talking about COVID, but we, we still are. And not only we still have COVID, we have the still people concerned about the vaccine. We also now have long COVID because it's gone on for such a long time that people who are um, worried about and infected with long COVID and we want to talk about that next week. So please dial in next week. We'll have a great panel as usual. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you, but I will hand over for some really important information about our sessions to the, the team. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Ngozi, and lovely seeing everyone this morning on Khan's Health Hour. Thank you so much again, Dr. Ngozi, and thank you so much, Dr. Kwesi, for joining us this morning as we talk about, you know, recognising the different black skin conditions. Thank you so much for those as well on, on Zoom, on YouTube, Facebook, um, time after time, every week. It's lovely to see new faces. Um, you know, for those that are new to us to, today, um, this is Khan's Health Hour. We've been having our health hour sessions since May 2020. Every week we have different medical professionals come in, take out their own Saturday afternoon, really, and talk about different health related topics that are affecting us as the black community. Um, as Dr. Ngozi rightfully said, COVID is still very much around and we want to still educate our community around this topic. Um, if people have any questions, you know, definitely feed those in at help at Khan. 
www.ethicsmartcoaching.org.uk. So definitely tune in next week. There's so much in store for you. Um, you can send your questions ahead of time, like Dr. Ngozi said, and we can, you know, answer those questions and give that to our um, medical professional that will be tuning in next week. Um, like Dr. Ngozi rightfully said, if you want to watch this session back, you can always go back to our Khan YouTube channel or Facebook channel to watch this session again. And you can also share it to your family, friends, colleagues um, to benefit um, from, you know, what we've just learned today, really. Um, so that would be great. Some of our upcoming events that you can also expect. We have our Khan Healthy Hearts, which is every Tuesday evening from 5.30 to 7.30 here on Zoom. Uh, we are having our tailored support sessions. That's where we have some of our nutritionists that would, you know, focus more on our diet. Um, and like, you know, Dr. Crazy rightfully said, you know, looking after ourselves is very important. Um, so we have those tailored health, um, um, tailored support sessions um, from 5.30 till 7. And then from 7 till 7.30, we follow on with some physical activity um, with our physical instructor, Orlando. So you can definitely tune into that. And if you'd love to be a part of that, there's still time to sign up. Um, that's events at khan.org.uk. So definitely feel free to give us an email and we'll share those details over to yourselves. And don't forget, again, Health Hour is back again next week. You can register in advance. And again, it's the same details. Um, but for those that want to join on, on Zoom, um, just feel free to email us again at health at khan.org.uk. Thank you for that. Um, just again, throughout the week, if you have any concerns, any issues, you know, just want to talk to someone, our helpline is always available and you can feel free to contact us on our helpline here at Khan. Um, and you can also contact us on our emails as well. And, um, you know, a member of our team will always be there, you know, just to support and um, just, you know, help you in one way or another. Um, so definitely tune into that. We've posted, uh, we, we like we, Dr. Ngozi rightfully said, we want to hear from you, the community. We've done different topics every week, time after time. And now we want to hear from you. What topic would you say you want to hear? You, you know, you really want to hear, um, you, you have questions around and you want to hear from one of our medical professionals. You know, we've just posted our survey links for those tuned in on Facebook and YouTube and for those on Zoom as well feel free to complete that it's just feedback we want to hear from you um, you know and you know definitely hear your feedback and see how we can implement those changes going forward what topic do you want to know um, more about um, do you want to hear from us on feel free to email us, feel free to contact us, and we can see how we can, you know, implement that going forward this year. Some of our other events as well, you know, that you can definitely, um, you know, keep in your diary. We have our International Women's Day event coming up, and that's on the 8th of March. So please do put that in your calendar. Um, and we look forward to seeing some of you at some of these events as well. Um, so yeah, we look forward to seeing you all. Um, please, 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 we're here to support, we're here for the community, and uh, we hope you have a lovely remainder of the week, um, weekend, and we look forward to seeing you at some of our events. Have a lovely day. Calm Health Hour. Get informed today to have a better, healthy tomorrow.